Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lalchuk. That's me, and I'm so glad you're here. If you like what we do, I'd love it if you gave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And if you're so compelled, write a review. That really helps, and maybe tell a friend or family member. They might like the show as much as you do. If you want to get involved in the program, visit our website, talkingbeats.com, and click Support the Show, where you can make either a one-time or a recurring donation. As we look to continue having cliche-free conversations of real substance with a diverse range of the world's most compelling people, your support is so appreciated, especially as we look to expand and increase our offerings. If you have a question, comment, or thought, Find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Or if you wish to reach out directly, email me at daniel at talkingbeats.com. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get on with today's conversation. On today's program, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He's had one of the most distinguished military careers of the past decades, including major roles in the Gulf War and Operation Iraqi Freedom. His career culminated with his appointment to the post of National Security Advisor to the United States. He received his PhD in American History from the University of North Carolina and continues to this day to be a student of history. He's the author of the books Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, The Joint Chiefs of Staff, and The Lies That Led to Vietnam, and Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. Retired since 2018, he's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, a fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute, and a lecturer at the Graduate School of Business, all of Stanford University. His broad view of history and vast experience in our volatile world, coupled with his love of music and culture, make him an especially suited guest for this program. Known not for his loyalty to one person, but rather for his unwavering devotion to the promise of the Constitution of this country, I'm honored he's joining me right now. General H.R. McMaster, welcome, sir. Hey, Daniel, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. You've spent your life serving the United States in the military, defending this country physically, but also defending the ideals of our democracy enshrined in the Constitution. It's October 2021. How is our democratic system doing? Well, Daniel, you know, we're under duress, right? I think I think all of us have have experienced uh, some difficult years and 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 experienced traumas associated with a a pandemic, a recession associated with the pandemic, the social and racial divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the violent aftermath, the vitriolic political partisanship that culminated in, in an assault on our first branch of government on January 6th and now of course the trauma of a lost war, a lost war, I think, based on self-defeat uh, in, in Afghanistan. So it's a heck of a lot to get through. But one of the benefits of studying history is you realize that th- th- this sort of difficulty, these difficulties are not unprecedented. And I think what we should do is have confidence, right? Confidence in our in our republic and our ability, I think, to strengthen our republic uh, and to apply correctives to the problems that we're encountering you know, below the threshold of, of revolution, right? That's what sovereignty lying with the people, I think, is is all about. Not many people in the military have studied history in terms of the depthful and, and the rich way that you have and written about it as well. And you just mentioned history. And obviously, as a, as a professor, you interact with young people at Stanford all the time and probably other places as well. You have to bring history to the present and make them meld together to provide context. So, so give us a little context. All of these things you mentioned, lost war, huge divisions that seem to be insurmountable, but hopefully they're not, et cetera, et cetera. The litany you just mentioned, the stress of the pandemic, which isn't unprecedented, but no one alive today has felt that before. How do we navigate through? How do we wake up every day and, and say, yes, this country has the highest aspirations and and I, as a citizen, must do my best to meet them. Well, Daniel, I think what we have to do first and foremost is recognize we do have agency, right? We we do live in a democracy. We have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. If we if we don't like what we're seeing in government, you know, demand better from our politicians, vote them out, put people in, uh, or, or or run yourself, right? So that so that you can uh, make it make a difference. But you know, of course, we, we're not we're not a monarchy either, right? We're 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 a federal system, and so much of of 
our, our lives and, and the, the type of community that we're in is determined by the local level. What we can do, not only in local government, but in organizations, in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. You know, if you, if you really want to make sure that you know, young people in this country have equal access to the great promise of the country, hey, demand education reform, you know, volunteer in, the, in your local Boys and Girls Club. So I think all of us have to recognize we have agency. I think what's frustrating these days is that I think there's a, what we're being told oftentimes uh, is, is that these problems are intractable. I think when you put the words institutional or systemic in front of the problems we're facing, what you do is you leave people with a really toxic combination of anger and resignation. So I, I think we can, you know, we, we can all do something about it. Daniel, you know what? I'm thinking of a, of a Clinton quotation, and by Clinton, of course, I, I mean George Clinton of Parliament Funkadelic, who when who when who when the 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 uh, the album came out, I think it was '72. America eats her young had this this track on it, and and the title of the track and the, and the main lyric in the track was, "If you don't like the effect, don't produce the cause." So I think all of us can can do our part to not produce the cause these days. I'm thrilled that you mentioned music so early on. You went there, and that's great. You understood the the name of this show, which is Talking Beats, after all, which can also refer to the news beat, uh, but but <laughs> it, it does have a, a musical grain in it as well. So something you mentioned I, I like a lot, which is that so many people like to complain, uh, to say the least, about the system, but and I run across these people all the time, and I say, well, have you voted in every election that you've been eligible to vote in? And oftentimes the answer is no. And I said, well, have you have you considered running for office? Well, no. So it, it, it is odd that, that you have this culture of airing grievances constantly, 24-7. But a lot of the people who air these grievances, and I'm embarrassed to say many young people, of which I'm a member of that class, don't even vote. Right, right. And uh, exactly. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I, like, I think the music analogy is a really good one, right? I think we're all kind of in a band. Right. And, 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 you know, everybody's playing different instruments and they've got different interests, maybe. But, you know, we're, we're like we're, you know, we're playing behind the beat, I think. You know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're off beat and, and we need to we need to start playing in the pocket together, you know. And I think the way to do that is to have meaningful, respectful discussions about the greatest challenges we're facing and then work together. Right. To overcome th- those challenges. I think this this sense of, you know, the sense of resignation or. You know that, or, or that we can't, that, you know that we can't do anything. And a lot of this, you know, I'll tell you, Daniel, it goes back. It goes back to really, in, I think, an infection in academia, and and in, in particular, I'm thinking of postmodernist theory and critical theories, which were designed to kind of deconstruct everything under the belief that all of the ills of the world are based on sort of power structures that have to be completely brought down, right before. You know, before anything can change. Well, you know, I, I don't believe that, Daniel. I believe that our our founders were pretty brilliant in this, in terms of d- devising a form of government in which sovereignty does lie with the people. And and of course, you know, we didn't realize uh, that all of our principles on which the republic was founded, we still haven't. We have work to do. Of course, that we didn't remove the greatest blight on our history, the institution of slavery, until the most destructive war in our history. Uh, almost a hundred years after the founding of the republic, but but our founders knew they knew that our republic would require what they said in the, in their terms constant nurturing, and so that's what I think we ought to be about these days is is working together uh, to build a, a better America, you know, and, and a better world for generations to come. I was just on the tennis court yesterday, and I, I was with a colleague from the symphony. I said to him, you know, I don't get why some people fall out of the pocket sometimes while they're playing. They, which is the phrase you just used, why they fall out of the pocket, meaning they, they just get out of the groove. And once you're in the groove, just stay in it. Don't rush. Don't drag. Just do the right thing. And <laughs> and so I, I expand that to um, to what you said, looking at this this country, we're all sort of little off kilter collectively somehow. Right. Um, right. So there's this whole thing that you mentioned about the school of thought saying, you know, burn it all down. The system's so bad, so flawed that we, we need to pour kerosene on it, light a match, you know, run away till it's gone and then start from something new. I want you to expound, if you would, sir, a little more on this and why that isn't the right way to go, why the better way to go is to improve where we see problems to refine and rebuild versus destroy. Well, you know, I, th- I think one of the one of the problems with this kind of approach, the postmodernist approach, whatever 
you want to call this kind of range of critical theories that are that have you know, really have their roots in you know, in, in Marxism. This is the kind of thinking that led to Nazism. I mean, this is not really you know this is not really something we want to embrace because what happens is they teach us that we are not allowed even to empathize with one another any longer, and we want to we want to classify people into either a role of oppressor. Or, or various stratas of, of victimhood. And what this what these theories do is they actually valorize victimhood and, and of course, then sap us of, of our determination to overcome obstacles together and work together. And I think it is, it, but fundamentally, this loss of empathy, the, the, the loss of the ability to put yourself in one's shoes, right? If you try to do that <laughs> these days, you might be accused of, you know, cultural appropriation or something. But uh, of course, uh, it's an appreciation for how others see these challenges. That is the first step in being able to work together, right? To find common ground. And I wish we would, once we once we empathize with one another, once once we try to understand, you know, the the, the problems we're facing, the opportunities we face from the perspective of others, just try to begin conversations with what we can agree on. Because I'll, I'll tell you, Daniel, I think if we just did that, we could get a heck of a lot done uh, in, in in a lot of the you know in a lot of the areas problem areas that we're facing in terms of education reform, equal access to uh, to quality health care to you know, climate change, for for example. I mean, there's a lot we can we can agree on if we just have meaningful, respectful discussions. I'm glad you mentioned appropriation. It's a word that comes up a lot. And uh, th- there was that old expression that imitation is a form of flattery. But I- is that gone out the window now? I mean, when, when I when I make a dish, you know, I make a dish from a Chinese cookbook. I have great, it's a wonderful cookbook. Love Chinese food. It's a challenge to make a home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we try. We do the best we can. We want to try something new. And suddenly there's this tinge coming out. Oh, I saw a post on social media that says, you're appropriating if, if you do it and you don't do this correctly. Or remember the, the famous emblematic, now emblematic case out of Oberlin where, where the uh, cafeteria was accused of making not culturally appropriate and not accurate enough ethnic food. I think it was Mexican or something like that. W- right. What is what is it? I don't even know how to say <laughs> what I want to say. Well, why is yeah. this level of absurdity accepted? Well, because I think we're indoctrinating our children with these crazy ideas, right? <laughs> and if, I mean, the, these range of theories are, I think, are associated with the new left interpretation of history. But in particular, these days, I would say post-colonial theory is the best label you can put on it. And and that's really an effort to decolonize everything, right? As you're mentioning from cafeteria food to, to academic curricula to hairstyles, right? And so I, I think what, what <laughs> in this effort to, to, I guess, I mean, under the auspices of of being more sensitive, I mean, I think it's extraordinarily insensitive in the, in, in the interest of of of, uh, of attacking, you know, racism and bigotry and and prejudice and uh, of all forms. It is actually a, a racist ideology, and of course, uh, this this bleeds over into elements elements of critical race theory. I think this has become just a kind of a you know, a heated term. But I think what we ought to do is just explore the elements of uh, of these theories and just put them to the test. I think we should ask our children or the younger generation that, that, are, that, that are anxious to become social justice warriors, hey, do you really think, do you really think that we should judge one another by identity category rather than and this is overused, but it's it's true. It's you know, what 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 Martin Luther King said is that he you know he had a dream that that we would his children would be judged by the content of their character. How about their empathy? How about their work ethic and so forth, rather than identity category? Now, what critics will say to that line of thinking, Dan, or my criticism is that well, the, you know, you're just papering over, you know, uh, the, the the legacy of, of slavery, which we're still coping with today. I think we just have to recognize we're still coping with it. Um, and and we have yet to get over it. We have not yet realized equality of opportunity for all Americans. I, I, and I completely acknowledge that. But I do think that what's sad about these sorts of uh, th- these reified philosophies is that they do rob us of our agency, and they tell us, "Hey, we we can't we can't empathize with one another." And the effect that that has is it wears down our social fabric, right? It, 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 it sort of reduces our, our, our common identity as, as Americans, you know? And, and I think what's sad about that is again, that really saps our ability to improve ourselves. You know, the philosopher, the late philosopher, Richard Ward, he said, you know, he said, he said that, you know, pride, you know, pride is to nations, what self-respect is to individuals a necessary ingredient for self-improvement. And, and I think that's what we're missing today, Daniel. 
Absolutely. I, I was I was thinking about one of the few things that can really bring people together, which is music, which is part of the reason I started this show. I think the conversation and the listening, the collective shared experience of music together, whether it's in a big concert hall or, or, or a concert venue outdoors or, or just listening with a group of friends, you know, after dinner, sitting around the table or something can absolutely destroy barriers. And, and then when you look at something so universal as Beethoven, a, a symbol of humanity that's carried through hundreds of years all over the world, uh, and suddenly see him being attacked as a symbol of colonial stomping over the oppressed peoples. Uh, I, I wrote an article that was pretty widely read called Then They Came for Beethoven. As, uh, this, this is the, the great symbol of unity. And his most famous piece, the Ninth Symphony, most famous piece of music ever written, of course, features a great poetry by Schiller about brotherhood and humanity. Right. And even this was taken and said, no, no, this is, this is, this is wrong. Musicologists, very odd field for which I think very little, uh, were attacking Beethoven uh, and his unifying message as basically false. Right, right. So, so if you do say, if you do aspire to color blindness, you're accused of, of of racism, right? And and of course, Daniel, I come I come from a background where where you, you know I think similar to 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 music, right? Everybody's got to play together, right? And and you know you, you judge one another in the military based on what you bring to the team and your commitment to the principles that that bring soldiers together. Uh, under under what you know what you might call the warrior ethos, right? Which are is really a sacred trust. A sacred trust uh, based on on you know on principles you know like courage, honor, and and uh, selflessness, willingness to sacrifice for one another and and for the mission, and and if you begin to judge people by by criteria uh, by criteria other than that by identity category, you're you're just in just doing that you're you're dividing the uh, people up and and you're breaking down unit cohesion. And the confidence that comes from unit cohesion, and that's what's fundamental to combat power, you know, in in, in a military unit. So I, I really I see this from the lens of my experience, obviously in the military, as as really a, a destructive, a destructive to our society, to, and destructive to every institution that it infects. I think, I think that musicology is sort of an offshoot of, of the linguistics field, uh, which was one of the forerunners of, of critical theory, and, and this sort of. There's a whole range of it, right? And and these labels are, cause are only of limited utility. You have to look at the body of work of, in each of these. But you know, post-colonial theory, critical race theory, queer theory, right? It's it's just an ever a never-ending effort uh, to tear us apart from one one another uh, in, in a way that I think fosters intolerance and division. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your background as a as a, you grew up in Philadelphia, and I, I wonder about your your early stirrings in terms of wanting to both study history. I mean, you you have a PhD, history of the military, history of combat, et cetera, but also uh, wanting to serve this country in a military capacity. Where did that come from? You know, I, it really came from my parents, Daniel. My 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 father volunteered to serve in, uh, during the Korean War at age 17. Uh, he went there as a private. He came back as sergeant first class. He then transitioned into the reserves, so I didn't live the the life of uh, of a military family. We didn't, because uh, I grew up in the same house on Flamingo Street in the Roxborough neighborhood of Philadelphia, um, my my whole life until I until I went away to, to West Point. Um, and you know, I re I really was drawn to the military service because of the sense of being part of bigger something bigger than yourself and being part of a team that's committed to excellence and and committed to one another and is engaged in in a noble purpose. And then. Then my mom, my mom uh, taught in Philadelphia for uh, well over thirty years in, in one of the most underserved uh, neighborhoods in North Philadelphia at Clymer School on Twelfth and Rush in North Philadelphia, and got, she inspired her students. She was great, great at her job, and and so I wanted to 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 be able to be in a leadership position that maybe allowed me to make a positive difference in people's lives. I think. You know, uh, leading soldiers and teaching kind of goes hand in hand. So I was drawn uh, to, to this by my from my parents, and then my mom uh, was also uh, a student of history. You know, and so growing up in Philadelphia, what a great place, right, to learn about the founding of our country. And then when we took vacations, you know, we would go to like Gettysburg or Williamsburg or like a or Boston, you know, or someplace where that had historical significance, and 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 go to you know battlefields or historical sites and. 
And so I, I think that that just kindled in me the, the, both these interests of serving in the army and studying history. How do you go from entering the military to ending up as a national security advisor for the United States? It doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> well, it, it, I think it, maybe it does. I mean, I, there's, no, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no way that I could have predicted it, Daniel. I mean, I, I think that what was, you know, when I look back on my career, what's interesting about it to me is, is that nothing ever really quite worked out the way that I'd wanted it to work out. Right. I, you know, I, I, uh, my, my wife, uh, Katie was very funny, uh, at my, at my retirement, uh, party, you know, she gave this great uh, talk, which was kind of a roast of me, you know, <laughs> and, and, and she said, you know, when I, when I married HR, you know, he was going to get out of the, get out, get out of the army in five years. Thank you for the bonus 29. Right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, you know, I was commissioned in aviation. They found astigmatism in my eye. Uh, and so they made me an armor officer. I said, well, you know, I'd rather be infantry. And they said, nope, you're armor. I said, okay, well, thanks. Uh, well, how about sending me to Germany? Cause I'm excited about that. There are a lot of tanks there. It's the front lines of the cold war. They said, Hey, thanks for your preference. You know, Fort Hood, Texas it is right. I mean, that's that way the army treats you, but I'll <laughs> tell you uh, every assignment I went to, uh, I, I really, I, I would not have traded it in, in retrospect. I got to serve with amazing, wonderful people, I have a wide range of, of experiences, you know, in the United States and, and abroad. Hey, and the army sent me to, to study history by full time for two years at the university of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I had great professors and mentors there, Dick Cohn and the, the late Don Higginbotham who was such a fine person, Daniel, great sense of humor. You know, this is what's interesting. I think, you know what, you know, I think that the study of history helps generate empathy. And I think also psychologists have, have studied this is that appreciation of music is also an indicator of your ability to empathize with others. So I, I think that, you know, I think in many ways, I write about this in, this, in my recent book, Battlegrounds, is that we need to generate in international affairs, strategic empathy, right? The ability to see complex challenges and opportunities from the perspective of, of others. And I think across military career, it's probably one of the most important, you know, skills, predispositions you have to have is toward empathy, to understand your soldiers, to understand, you know, how to, you know, how to build cohesive effective uh, and combat ready teams, but also how to empathize with others abroad, whether it's in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, and and to be able to connect to our common humanity, right? I mean, Daniel, there's so much that these days about, you know, what distinguishes us from others, but I, I think that that our common humanity is much stronger than any of the, the cultural, social, religious differences that I've encountered internationally. Retired from the government, retired from the military, or I should say out of government and retired from the military. I wonder, how are you enacting your goals for what you were just talking about, for camaraderie, for increased right. cooperation, for the ability to see others, the humanity in others all around the world? What are you doing other than instilling in the students who are lucky to study with you at Stanford, the higher goals that you're talking about. Well, you know, I, I, maybe predictably for, for like a, you know, a washed up general, I made a mission statement for myself in this second career. And it was to contribute to a, a deeper understanding of the greatest challenges and opportunities we face as a way to, to bring people together uh, and and identify how we can work together to build a better future. And so I'm, I try to do that through my scholarship and writing this this book, Battlegrounds: The Fight to Defend the Free World, is 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 a you know a, a tangible part of that effort. Uh, but also associated with that is, as you mentioned, teaching. I mean, I, I thought what I'd missed the most in the army is working with young, talented, dedicated uh, men and women, right? Which which is what you have in our all volunteer, extraordinary uh, military these days. But I get to I get to work with incredibly incredibly talented, dedicated students. I've, I've I sense a, a huge untapped desire to serve uh, here at Stanford, and then also I, I have an affiliation as a fellow at Arizona State University, which is an amazing institution as well. I mean, it's like you know I think seventy five thousand in person and eighty five thousand um, other uh, students, and and uh, and that it's a, it's a, it's an institution dedicated to making high quality education more accessible for more people. And, and so that's been fun. So the teaching part of it, and then what I'm trying to do is, is, is develop, d develop material like you do on this, on this podcast, uh, that, that helps, you know, bring the stories of others to, to, uh, to, to audiences. And this is a, a podcast, uh, called battlegrounds unimaginatively, the same as my, <laughs> the same as the book, but, but, but it's, it's really just long format interviews with world leaders to hear their perspectives 
on the challenges and opportunities we face uh, in- internationally. You know, I hope that I can make a difference in some volunteer organizations. I'm so proud of our students in response to this catastrophe in Afghanistan. We've formed as a team of uh, about 14 uh, graduate and undergraduate students under the direction of my amazing chief of staff. Um, and what we're doing is trying to unburden Afghan refugees from the from the paperwork associated with special immigrant visas and P1 and P2 visas. We're attempting to to, to connect them uh, to re- relief agencies and philanthropic organizations that can help integrate them into, into new communities and help them take advantage of the great promise of America or in, or in third countries. Uh, and then we're doing an oral history program so we can hear their stories, you know, hear what they've experienced. And not only just in, in, the, in the latest period in Afghanistan, but, but across the last 20 years in Afghanistan. You've mentioned Afghanistan a few times, and it's something you've written about and spoken about a lot uh, uh, this late summer and fall. And and you wrote uh, that a fundamental, I'm quoting here, a fundamental lesson of Afghanistan is that wars are interactive and that progress in war and diplomacy is never linear. That is why the war in Afghanistan and the broader war against jihadist terrorist organizations is not over. It is entering a new, more dangerous era. So what do you mean that wars are interactive and progress is never linear? What does that mean? Well, it just means that in war, obviously, you're in a contest and, and your enemies, your, uh, your adversaries, they, they, have, they have a say in, in the future course of, of, of events. And, and so, it, so their, their responses and initiatives are oftentimes unpredictable. And, and, uh, and so what, it, what does it take to win? It, it takes to win? What it takes to win is the consolidation of gains to get the sustainable, usually political outcomes consistent with what brought you into war to begin with. And of course, uh, defeating your enemy, right? It means convincing your enemy that, that that enemy can no longer accomplish his objectives through the use of violence. And and what's sad about Afghanistan is, you know, what we, we did the opposite uh, 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 of what you would do if you understood the nature of war, right? We gave, we gave our enemies and announced in, years in advance the timeline for our withdrawal. And then of course, the effect that that had is it emboldened our enemies and it, it sowed doubts among our allies, our Afghan allies in particular. And, and sadly, in this, this last year, we just delivered blow after psychological blow to our Afghans and strengthened the Taliban on our way out, right? We didn't, we didn't permit the Afghans to, to join us uh, in the negotiation with the Taliban or the Taliban didn't permit it and we acquiesced to that. So that, that affected their legitimacy. Then we forced the Afghans to, to release 5,000 of some of the most heinous criminals on earth who immediately went back to, to terrorizing the Afghan people. We did not demand a ceasefire, even as, as the Taliban intensified a, a, hor- a horrific assassination campaign and continued mass murder attacks against maternity hospitals and, and girls' schools. We did nothing about that. We stopped actively targeting the Taliban. We removed our support, uh, including all of our air power and our intelligence support, and then our contractor support from them. I mean, and 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 then we wondered, you know, we said, well, "Gosh, I wonder how the rapid collapse happened." Well, we actually enabled it. And, and what's astonishing to me, Daniel, is we just were oblivious, I think, to continuities in the nature of war. Right? War is political. War is human. People fight for the same reasons Thucydides identified twenty five hundred years ago: fear, honor, and interest. You know, you hear today, you hear today the Secretary of State saying, you know, the, the, our engagement in Afghanistan is just entering a new diplomatic phase. Diplomatic phase with the Taliban? I mean, you know, all you need to know is that Haibatullah Akhanzada, the head of the, of the Taliban, encouraged his 17-year-old son to commit mass murder by suicide, right? And so he's going to be worried about international opprobrium. Uh, and 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 uh, and it's just it's it's laughable. If, if it would be laughable, if it wasn't so sad. And then of course, war is uncertain because of the interactive nature. And war is a contest of wills. And it seems that we just forgot all of that, and and then assumed in our narcissistic way this tendency to define the world only in relation to us, and assume that what we do is decisive toward or or not do is it decisive toward achieving a favorable outcome. Uh, we just we just. We just thought that you know we, that we could leave and, and there would be no consequences. What do you say to the people who who would say, "Well, how long were we supposed to stay?" What would your response be to that? I think as long as the American people would support the effort, right? So a question is always when you're you're at war as a as a democracy, right? Is is not really uh, whether or not you can win the war, but whether or not you can win the war at a cost that's acceptable to the to the American people in Afghanistan. We could have sustained 
the level of commitment to prevent from happening what we're seeing happening now, right? The collapse of the Afghan government and Afghanistan in control of, of a terrorist organization. So how do we, how would we do that? By enabling the Afghans to continue to bear the brunt of the fight, which they were doing. Now, would that take 10,000 troops or 8,000 or 3,000? I mean, who knows? But it would I think the American people would support it. I mean, 10,000 troops for the United States, it, it, it sounds like a lot maybe, but it's actually very small when you consider the 50,000 troops that are in Japan, the 30,000 troops that are in South Korea, you know, the, the 30 plus thousand that are in Europe, right? So, but the question is, would American presidents tell the American people what they need to know to make that evaluation to see if they'll support that war? And that is, what is at stake? And then what is a strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at an acceptable cost? Three presidents in a row, Daniel, told the American people, hey, it's not worth it. We just need to get out. So I don't think it should be a surprise that public support was in favor uh, of withdrawal or the, or the majority of Americans favored getting out. You use the word linear. How, how do you see the lineage from Bush to Biden and yeah. what happened in those intervening decades well, so so first we you know we we went into Afghanistan under this idea that we could we could enable a very fast lightning victory uh, with air power uh, with special forces advisors and, and intelligence officials on the ground uh, use mainly using Mujahideen era militias opposed to the Taliban to do the fighting. Now, of course, that worked in collapsing uh, the Taliban because it shows the Taliban is actually militarily not very strong. Right, their their main competitive advantage is their regenerative capacity, which which rested in Pakistan, and their utter brutality and unscrupulousness that allows them to impose a pall of fear uh, on civilian populations. But when you, when you take that away, right, when, you, when you're able to go after their forces effectively, uh, they collapse pretty quickly. But we didn't have sufficient forces there uh, to, to block their egress into Pakistan, where they were generated with the help of the Pakistan Army's in, inter-services intelligence, the shadowy arm of the intelligence arm of the Pakistani army, and with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda helped regenerate uh, the Taliban. So we had a hammer in the form of these militias, but we didn't have an anvil uh, along, that, along that border. And then what was most consequential is that these Mujahideen era militias affected state capture over state institutions that had been destroyed by the Taliban, had been destroyed by the civil war, had been destroyed uh, in part by the, by the Soviet occupation uh, and, the, and the aftermath in the, in the 80s and, and the resistance to it. And, and what, what these groups did is that they, they endeavored to consolidate power in advance of a post-America Afghanistan. And what were, what were we telling them at the time, Dan? We're telling them, hey, we're leaving. Okay, we're leaving. You know, Secretary Rumsfeld went there on the same date that President Bush made that mission accomplished speech uh, after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and said, hey, we're out of here. Well, what did Afghans do? They looked over their shoulders and they said, okay, nobody's got our back. We've got we've to make some accommodations. And it was then that really the political settlement in Afghanistan became reliant on unchecked criminality. Uh, and these Mujahideen era militias morphed into criminalized patron patronage networks that, be, that were hollowing out state institutions that we we're trying to help them build. And, and, uh, and so the short-term approach to a long-term problem in Afghanistan actually lengthened the war and made it more difficult. Then what did we do? We realized, okay, well, we got diverted by Iraq, right? And, the, and then, the, of course, the need to reinforce the security effort there during the so-called surge in Iraq in 2007 and 2008. And then we returned to Afghanistan. This is the Bush administration still in 2008 and said, okay, well, we have a problem here. And our response was to dump a lot of money, Daniel, into Afghanistan, well beyond the absorptive capacity of that of that economy, and that exacerbated a lot of the corruption and organized crime uh, threats to 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 you know to the viability of the Afghan state. Then, under the Obama administration, the Obama administration reinforced the security effort, but only in part of uh, of what uh, General McChrystal then at the time had recommended. Uh, but what the Obama administration did at the same time, this is December two thousand nine. President Obama gave a speech at West Point and he said, okay, we're going to reinforce the security effort in Afghanistan. And here's the timeline for the withdrawal of those troops at the same time. I mean, how's that work? And then, and then the Obama administration engaged in self-delusion about the nature of the enemy, you know, and, and, and said, you know, well, there's no Al Qaeda left in Afghanistan, which was untrue. Uh, so what we have to do is prioritize counterterrorism in Pakistan. And therefore, we just need to be nicer to Pakistan, and Pakistan will cooperate with us against al-Qaeda in Pakistan and, and against other terrorist groups. It was a complete pipe dream. And of course, that strategy you know, plays out it, it, through, through, the, through the Obama administration, where and we, we no longer designate the Taliban as an enemy. 
The Taliban is gaining strength at the same time as we're trying to negotiate with them and this Taliban political commission in Doha gutter. And, and these people in, in Doha, they were just a shop window for the people who were continuing to brutalize the Afghan people. These are people who are sending their, their, their daughters to private schools while they're bombing girls' schools in, in Afghanistan. And then the Trump administration, when it when it came in, I think administered a corrective to these unwise policies. And in 2017, had in place the, for the first time a sustainable, viable, realistic approach to Afghanistan. But of course, President Trump abandoned it, and then, and then he doubled down on all the flaws of the Obama administration with the capitulation negotiations that culminated in a surrender to a terrorist organization in February of 2020. I don't think there's any other way to describe to describe that agreement. And then, of course, we we forced the Afghan government to make all these concessions that I mentioned, delivered these psychological blows. The Biden administration could have, but decided not to back away from that agreement and stuck to a slightly delayed timeline for the complete withdrawal. And then you have what is just the beginning of a catastrophe there, a humanitarian catastrophe, a security t- catastrophe, and, and I think a political catastrophe in connection with, with our reputation and, and our uh, in particular, reputation for reliability uh, internationally. Did you tell Trump? Did you warn him? Did 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 you say we can't do this? Please. Did you plead with him what, at the time when you were there? Well, you know, what, no. What we did, you know, in in 2017, when I you know I I wound up you know quite <laughs> unexpectedly as national security advisor in the at the, in, at the end of February of uh, of 2017, I immediately prioritized Afghanistan because I thought that the war in Afghanistan was not only uh, being waged in in a way that was incompetent. But it also had become unethical because we we did not keep our focus on on a just intention to use Thomas Aquinas's term in in Jus uh, ad bellum theory, right? Uh, you know, the, that war should be, must be oriented to be ethical on a just intention. We lost sight of what the hell we're doing. So I went to South Asia, uh, I, to to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, and to India to jumpstart a process of giving President Trump options. Now, you might recall, like during the 2016 election, he had said, we need to get out of Afghanistan. This was part of the end the endless wars mantra that was prevalent really across both political parties. But he but he, he said, we, we just need to get out of Afghanistan, that we've wasted our whole effort there. So what, what we did when we showed him options is that's the first option we showed him. And you know, the picture we painted, Daniel, was the picture of what's happening right now. So he looked over that precipice and said, well, yeah, I don't, don't want to do that. And 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 what he what he did is he put in place this strategy. That he gave a speech about it uh, at Fort Myer in Virginia, across the river from from Washington. And I I, st- I still commend that speech because I think it was the only time we had an effective strategy in place. But of course, you know, I left you know I left the White House. Not that me leaving was the decisive factor, but I left in in April of 2018. And I just don't know what happened. You know, other people got in his ear. Maybe some of these neo isolationists, you might call them, associated with. Uh, the alt-right or the so-called realist school of, of international policy who who really are romantics, uh, who, who believe that America's disadvantage, di- disengagement from the world everywhere is an unmitigated good, right? They see us as the problem. So, so you know, for, for those who see us as the problem, I'd say, okay, well, if you think America is a problem, what does Afghanistan look like now, you know, without America and without the, the coalition that we brought with us? A coalition, which by the way, was providing more troops than American troops uh, toward the end in Afghanistan. One of the great losses, uh, cultural losses from all of this is going to be the, the end of great music there. And of course, you can go on YouTube, as I've mentioned on here before, and watch the Afghan Women's Orchestra play Beethoven. It's one of the great things. And I saw earlier that there's a, a video from Reuters, uh, and the title is Afghanistan's All-Female Orchestra Falls Silent. And the idea, of the sounds of seeing and hearing them play Beethoven is so moving and and now it's gone and and you it's sort of a microcosm of all the all the things that are are going to be lost at the same time of course for someone my age for a millennial it's it's pretty extraordinary that that I mean I remember 911 as a as a young person then practically for my whole entire life there we are in Afghanistan but look let's talk uh, we don't have all the time in the world, unfortunately. So, General, let's talk music for a little bit. Now, you're a big music fan. What is music for you? What's on your playlist now? Oh, I'll tell you. So, so I, I you know, I, I really love music, <laughs> and uh, and I think it began when you know, when you're a plebe at West Point, 
during your first semester there, you can't have any music. At least that's the way it used to be. And you don't realize how much you love music until it's gone. Right? You can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't listen to it maybe. So, you know, I, I, I like, you know, I, I'm kind of maybe stuck a little bit, Daniel, in the, in the, uh, in the seventies. Right. I think it was just a, it was a, it was a hell of a decade. Right. We think we have problems now. Right. We had problems then. Right. We had a, we had the first president ever to resign from office uh, after the Watergate scandal. We had, you know, a lost war in, in Vietnam, the, you know, the assault on Saigon and the evacuation of our embassy in 75. We had stagflation, right? We had, you know, we, we had, uh, we had oil crises. And then at the end of that decade, we had the Iranian uh, revolution and the hostage crisis, right? So, so, Hey, we think we have problems today. Well, I think we can, we can, we can get over it if we could get over that, but you know, it was a, just a great decade for music, you know, and I, and I was a, I was a big fan of, you know, on, on the kind of one end of the spectrum, I guess, you know the bands like uh, like the, like the Rolling Stones, you know, but uh, but I would say also Led Zeppelin, you know, uh, I, anything you could listen to before a rugby match, you know, to get to get you fired up, you know, even <laughs> even some you know some George Thorogood or something along those lines, you know, the you know kind of in your face uh, rock and roll, you know, and and then but also I was into I was into into Motown music and and some of the you know the old school funk, you know, and. And it could be like the light version of that, like the Commodores, or the serious version of that, like uh, like Parliament Funkadelic, you know. And and uh, and so that that was my range of of, of music that that uh, that is still really I'm very fond of I'm very fond of today. But I I, I I like a lot of the newer bands as well, and and I like female vocalists, and and uh, you know I, I rely on my daughter for playlists. She does an am- amazing job, you know, in, in terms of. Uh, building my playlist. And what I, one of the things I do, Daniel, is I have a, I have a, a, a playlist of bumper music for the course that I teach in, um, in, in the graduate school business here at, at Stanford. And so, so, uh, for, you know, I, I this, the, the course is called building strategic competence, right? So, so, uh, so I talk about the need for collaboration, you know, and you know, the song, tighten it up, you know, yeah. so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's the, that's the song for, you know, for collaboration and you know, very clear, you know, it's bumper music, but then also a music metaphor there, certainly. Uh, and then I, uh, one of the lessons is on dealing with difficult personalities. And of course, Carly Simon, I'm a big fan of hers, you know, you're so vain. Um, I won't, I won't, uh, I, I won't allude to maybe who is the implicit character. Uh, that, that is, that is, the, that is the subject, the subject of that particular lecture. So, but I'll, I'll tell you, I think music, I, I think, I think, I think music makes everything better, you know, everything better. And, and so I try to introduce it even into the work I'm, the work I'm doing here. Everything better and, and everything clearer. There's always some lesson you can find in music. There's always some, some, even if you, you go back, you know, 400 years to Baroque operas set in France, you can find the same political lessons, the, the same corrupt politicians, the same uh, systems that are geared towards those in power, the French court and the revolution. Uh, it's amazing to see all the parallels. Ab- abs- absolutely. So you know. So I'll, I'll just give you. I'll, I'll just give you. Should I give you? Can I? Uh, should I summarize a little bit of play playlist please, right now? Please. Okay. All right. So so so. Uh, you know, we're we're on COVID, right? So the introductory introductory course. I wanted to get people to you know get people to you know to think positively. So Paul McCartney's Great Day, right? You can't go wrong with that. Then uh, then then a lot of the courses about continuities, right? And how you can learn from history and apply history to 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 uh, you know to the to contemporary problems. So, so giant sans version of the beat goes on, right? I mean, that, that's, that's great. <laughs> Talk about collaboration, Archie Bell and the drills tighten, tighten up, <laughs> uh, this theme of strategic empathy, you know, uh, feists, uh, you know, I feel it all, you know, uh, I got, I got to have a dead song there, right? Cause we all love <laughs> Mickey Hart, man. We love Mickey Hart, man. He's such a great guy. So, so, you know, pl- playing in the band, uh, which is like a, kind of the stoic philosophy of, 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 you know, of knowing who you are and what your role is, um, you know, you know, uh, how, how to deal with, uh, with difficult situations. Um, of course, you know, queen, you know, queen and David Bowie's rendition of under, under pressure. Right. I mentioned you're so vain. Um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the need to, the need for leaders to lead organizations, uh, you know, Kate LeBond's, are you with me now? Um, so, and then, and then also, you know, the, this theme of, of bringing people together, right? Sly and the family stone, everyday people, man. Can't go wrong with that. So, 
So that's, <laughs> I think about so, you know, what we're facing today a lot, a lot through the, you know, through the lens of, or, or I guess through, you know, listening to music. That is a big range. And I'm, I'm sure the, the, the students also are, are intrigued to, to hear the lecture, hear the music all, alongside it. That's, that's terrific. And I think we should, we should all go uh, and find these recommendations, pull them up, listen to them and listen to the lyrics too, because often there's, there's a lot we can learn, you know, talk about teaching and interacting with young people and the kinds of courses and lectures you give, what, what young people who you interact with, what are they bothered by right now the most? And does that tend to be the same thing that bothers you the most right now? Yeah, I think what bothers them, I think, is what they've been hearing, but it's not true, is that they don't have agency. They're frustrated, right? Not, none of us like what we're seeing going on, at least in the way in the way life in our country is portrayed, right? In the information domain, and especially, you know, it, with the toxicity of, of of social media and the pseudo media and the conspiracy theories and the you know and and, and the you know the, the hatred that, that is so apparent. But I think I think that 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 masks really the the fundamental strength of our country, and, and the vast majority of us, right, who who want to empathize with one another and, and work together. So I think they're frustrated by this the sense of, of lack of, of agency, and then also I think you know I I know this might be an overused term, but kind of the cancel culture you know they're frustrated by. And I'll tell you, a lot of students talk to me, Daniel, about 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 how they self censor. Because they're afraid of the reactions that they're going to get, and and I think that's scary, right? It's it, it's scary because you know it, it it sort of smacks of of you know authoritarianism, right? And and the inability to 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 you know to to express oneself, but also it prevents us from learning more about one another and coming together and reversing sort of this some of this polarization. So I I, I think that 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 is a genuine concern among among you know the range of students that I I, I interact with. Uh, across multiple, uh, you know, multiple institutions, and I think all of us have a role in this. We, I think, you really can, right? We can have meaningful, respectful discussions of these challenges. I often do in our class. It's really oftentimes just the way you bring about the way you bring it up, and and, and if you, I think, if you demonstrate your willingness to listen to others, right, and to to hear what they're saying, respond to what they're saying. But so many people today, you know, they they go right for emotion. And and they're so anxious to condemn others, right? And and I don't know if this is sort of an extreme form of of, of kind of virtue posturing or something, but it I think people are conditioned toward confrontation these days uh, in, instead of instead of resolution, right? Through you know through through meaningful discussion. Well, it's, it's so important. And as you know, it's it's also bleeding over into the artistic world. There's a music school in New York that's literally banned the teaching of a number of piano works by Debussy because of the title of those pieces in French. And when you think of, when you think about that, when you think about books being banned and, I, and even burnings that occasionally you hear about, uh, you wonder where we are in terms of deleting and canceling and uh, as, as a, a great guest on here, Dennis Washburn, said about the tale of Genji, that medieval Japanese novel. He said, yeah. he said, great art isn't going to go away just because you turn your back. It's disturbing, but it isn't going anywhere because you pretend it doesn't exist. I thought that was chilling. Right. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, for young people, I mean, reading, you can't go wrong reading Ray, Ray uh, Bradbury's account of, of, a, of a, you know, of authoritarian regime that burns books, right? And that, and that puts the family up on you know, on, on the wall of the, of the house to condition everybody, you know, or, or, or Orwell's, you know, animal farm or anything that Orwell's written, or, you know, I, I like, uh, one of my favorite, um, kind of, you know, modern, uh, philosophers and you know, actually a theologian as well, GK Chesterton. He has a, there's a collection of his essays called in defense of sanity, which when you, if you read them, they are, they're quite relevant to what we're seeing today as well. He was of course writing, I mean, he wrote something crazy, I think like 40 books or maybe even more than that it was extraordinarily prolific, but, but, uh, you know, his time was really in the pre-World War One, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, but they're very relevant today. I know you're working on something right now. I'm curious, in, in addition to the teaching, but what are you writing now? What, what are you What are you doing? In fact, I think to have this conversation, you you've interrupted the refining of, of something that you're putting the finishing <laughs> touches on. Is there another book down the pike, or what's 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 occupying you right now? Well, I'm supposed to be writing another book, which I, I certainly <laughs> I'm going to, and, and and I'm working on now. Uh, but um, but I just finished an essay on on the warrior ethos, what the warrior ethos is, why it's at risk, and what we have to do to protect it. So, um, 
it's a, it's a long essay that will appear in National Review, I think, uh, in the next, like the Veterans Day edition. A lot of what you're talking about today has to do with uh, support and positivity and empathy and, and not the fake kind of positive reinforcement participation trophies, but really, I think, a deep belief in the aspirations. It's a word I've used before, but it's such an important word. It's a moving word, the aspirations of this country, the best of what we can all aspire to collectively. Give us something concrete we can do to move ourselves, our community, collectively, our society towards that. Hey, I, I, well, I think I think a, con- a concrete thing to do is to is to reach out to others in your in your community, and then and then pick a problem. Just pick I mean, pick pick a problem that, that that you can solve together, right? And you, know, a, a friend of mine, he's just a wonderful person. He. Uh, you know, he, he lives in, in Austin and he looked around and there were homeless people and he said, hey, we, we need to do something about this. And and uh, he joined an, an organization that is doing tremendous work. Uh, they've been actually quite successful and, and they've developed a model that they're, you know, that they're exporting to, to other communities. You know, for, for him to really empathize with the, with the homeless community, he moved out of his house and moved into a, a trailer in the, in the middle in the middle of where the, the, where the biggest concentration of homeless people were. And 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 you know they're making they're making a big difference. So I just think that you know I just think that you know you don't have to make that level of commitment. But I think working with others, you know, everybody taking a little piece of a of a problem or an opportunity, we can all make a difference. General H.R. McMaster, words to the wise. I hope there's a next time. And meanwhile, I thank you very sincerely. Hey, Daniel, so great to be with you. Hopefully, I'll see you in person here soon. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk. The original theme music is by Ronald Barkham. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose, and Doug Christian is executive producer. We invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can support us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash talking beats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.